Okay, so we're actually uh, have put together uh, back to back uh, Martin's work on an inpatient uh, facility with uh, Dr. Melanie Harnett's work uh, in, on an outpatient setting. Uh, they dovetail rather nicely. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Melanie Harnett, uh, who's a research scientist here at the University of Washington. Uh, she's actually the research director of Marshall Linehan's clinic. Uh, and the principal investigator on, on NIMH, right? NIMH funded uh, study to develop PTSD for outpatients in this is, a, is an expert on the applications of PTSD treatment within the context of DBT for people with BPD. And if you could say all those letters really fast, one of her skills is she can. Okay. Um, but in addition, uh, I just want to say that Melanie's also uh, a, a terrific therapist and a person who's very good at teaching this treatment. Uh, so the term research scientist doesn't quite do her justice. It's well deserved, but she's more than that. Okay, so here's uh, Dr. Melanie Harnett. hear me? No? Try a little higher. There we go. Is that better? <laughs> All right. So um, as Martin said, uh, the research that I've been doing now for about a year and a half um, was when our grant started. This is an R34 treatment development grant um, from NIMH. Uh, we're focusing specifically on the outpatient side of things. And then another uh, thing just to sort of orient you before I jump in is uh, whereas Martin's treatment is focusing specifically on PTSD related to childhood sexual abuse, uh, I'm focusing specifically on PTSD in suicidal and self-injuring clients with borderline personality disorder, many of whom have childhood sexual abuse, um, but the focus is really on the fact that they're suicidal and self-injuring and also have BPD. So just to give you a brief overview, if you were here next month, this is what the University of Washington would look like. <laughs> uh, uh, there's some daffodils now, but not a whole lot else. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about why the treatment's needed, um, similar sorts of information as Martin provided. Talk to you about some of the preliminary results we're getting from our uh, initial open trial um, and our next steps in ongoing research. So why is this treatment needed? Particularly if, as this suggests, the problem has been solved. <laughs> in 30 days or less, Martin, here's a task for you. So, <laughs> so here's the problem um, that I'm particularly trying to address. So um, as I'm sure we're all aware, many clients who meet criteria for borderline personality disorder have a quite extensive history of trauma. Not all of them, of course, uh, but many of them do. And in the theory of the biosocial theory that underlies DBT, you know, part of it is that invalidating environment, which includes uh, abuse and trauma, again, some of the times, but not always. So if we've got this group of clients, many of whom have an extensive trauma history, therefore it's not surprising that, as Martin reviewed, about half of them meet full criteria for PTSD. Um, as we also know, sort of the hallmark feature of borderline personality disorder is uh, suicide, uh, suicide attempts and non-suicidal self-injury. Um, so 69 to 80% have engaged in one of these types of behaviors. 8 to 10% actually die by suicide. So um, we also know that PTSD, the, the clients with BPD who also have PTSD are less likely to remit from BPD over time. So the fact that they have this additional diagnosis, often one of many, but um, that PTSD seems to have an effect in terms of decreasing the likelihood that their BPD is going to be effectively resolved over six and 10 years is the period that this has been looked at in Mary Zanarini's research. Why might that be? Well, one possibility from a study I've done is that um, PTSD in this population is associated with uh, twice as much uh, self-injury within a one-year period. So clients who have both BPD and PTSD injure two times as often as those without PTSD. Um, so if there's a lot more self-injury going on, it's potentially less likely that they'd end up uh, remitting from BPD over time. So all those problems are interlinked, 
for, uh, clearly. And yet the treatment options to date really have been quite separate. Um, essentially, if you've got PTSD, you're sent in one direction um, to lots of evidence-based treatments like Ednafo's prolonged exposure therapy or Patty Rizek's cognitive processing, th processing therapy. But if you have self-injury or suicidal behavior on the scene, and often borderline personality disorder, you're kind of sent in this other direction um, to get treatment specifically for those issues. So starting on the PTSD side of things, um, historically, the thing that was most often uh, happening was that clients with borderline personality disorder were just excluded completely from uh, PTSD treatment. So this is a paper that was written in 1990, which is now officially old, which is a little shocking, um, <laughs> where they got together a group of experts, uh, all experts in PTSD treatment, particularly exposure-based PTSD treatments, surveyed them and said, who do you think is appropriate? Um, what kinds of clients should we be treating for, with exposure therapy for PTSD? Borderline personality disorder is one of the conditions that they agreed they thought was not, uh, was a reason not to do exposure therapy for PTSD. So that sort of matches the clinical lore. So, uh, and just to say that while that was in 1990, it's still not um, unheard of by any means to continue to exclude BPD clients from PTSD treatments. So this is a 2002 study, Marilyn Cloitra's study specifically, as Martin reviewed for childhood sexual abuse related PTSD, where she excluded BPD and a whole lot of other things. Um, just to make the point again, a 2006 study um, also excluding BPD from the PTSD treatments. So that's sort of the, the historical standard, if you will. Um, as the PTSD treatment field has progressed, they have been working to you know, continually decrease the number of exclusion criteria they're using, trying to make their PTSD treatments more generalizable and see if they work for um, more complex or more severe populations. So prolonged exposure therapy for PTSD, um, Edna Foa's treatment, this is the second edition of their manual, came out in 2007. So this is sort of the standard of the field at this point which is that they don't necessarily exclude people because of meeting criteria for BPD anymore, but they do exclude people, what they say with severe degrees of personality disorder, and then they give the specific example of an individual with BPD who has current serious self-injurious or destructive behavior. So essentially, they won't, at this point, generally speaking, um, just because you carry a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, does not mean that you will be necessarily excluded from, say, prolonged exposure therapy, but it's more the behaviors that come along with that that are often still going to get you excluded, particularly self-injury and suicidal behavior. So uh, Martin already reviewed some of this research, but this was um, from a meta-analysis by Bradley in 2005, which really highlights this problem of exclusion in PTSD treatments. So about 30% of patients who um, are screened for PTSD treatment studies end up being excluded. Um, the more exclusion criteria that a study used, so basically the more restrictive their samples are, the better results they get, which is not shocking. Um, <laughs> and the most common exclusion criteria they found, again, this is a meta-analysis across PTSD treatment outcome studies, uh, suicide risk, uh, substance abuse or dependence, and the sort of catch-all category of serious comorbidity which wasn't well-defined but would mean things like BPD or dissociative disorder or if they had a disorder um, where, where PTSD was no longer the principal diagnosis because they had another disorder that was determined to be more severe. So um, the Bradley paper specifically, the meta-analysis specifically, makes the comment that this uh, combination of exclusion criteria is highly likely to exclude many or most of our clients with borderline personality disorder. So again, not because they have BPD per se, but because they've got all these other behaviors that go along with it that are getting them excluded. So if we take this from the other side, so that was sort of the go over here if you have PTSD treatment, which for our clients is not an option if they've got any of these serious behaviors going on with it. So let's look at the other side when it's sort of going over here if you're the suicidal self-injuring client with BPD. So as we all know, DBT um, is the treatment that so far has the most empirical support. Um, and the way the treatment was originally developed was that stage one, 
is really focusing on getting the severe behaviors under control. So this is obviously suicidal behavior, self-injury as examples of those. Um, and that PTSD was addressed primarily in stage two, particularly when it was related to childhood trauma. Um, and so a quote from Marsha in the manual. <laughs> The second phase of therapy, begun only when previous target behaviors are under control, involves working directly on post-traumatic stress. So that's sort of the stage model of DBT and sort of the um, ideal you know, sort of way the treatment is going to play out. However, um, as uh, Martin had the same data up on his uh, talk, uh, from the paper that we did a couple of years ago looking at um, remission of Axis I disorders during DBT, when, D, when PTSD is not targeted in DBT, which it typically hasn't been in clinical practice, um, the remission rate is quite low. So in one year of DBT, we get a 13% rate of remission uh, of PTSD. And again, if you compare that to the meta-analysis of PTSD treatments, where we would expect to be getting about uh, slightly more than half of the clients remitting. So the question is why? Why are the numbers, uh, the remission rates lower in DBT than we might like? So here's one theory. Would be maybe it's the case that DBT just doesn't effectively treat co-occurring axis one disorders. So in this same paper, um, we looked at a range of axis one disorders. And as you can see here, DBT is extremely effective at treating this as substance dependence disorders. 87% of clients remit from substance dependence. Major depressive disorder, 68%. Eating disorders, 64%. Those three disorders, those are the same rates of remission you get in treatments designed just specifically for those disorders. Um, so that's really quite impressive in DBT. But when you get down to the last three, these are all the anxiety disorders, um, where the rates of remission are quite uh, much lower than those other three, and where PTSD is actually the disorder that's having the lowest rate of remission. And this has collapsed across a year of treatment and a year of follow-up. So I don't think we can safely say by any means that DBT does not effectively treat Axis I disorders. It obviously very effectively treats some of them, but it's not at the moment treating the anxiety disorders as well as we might like, and within the anxiety disorders, specifically PTSD. So here's another theory. So we have the stages of treatment, this, this idea that we've got to get or out of control behaviors under control before we would start dealing with PTSD. So maybe the problem is that DBT is not getting out of control behaviors under control well enough in the clients with PTSD so that PTSD treatment wouldn't be a reasonable thing to do. So somebody uh, IMing me, is that what's going on? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this was a, another uh, paper we published uh, this year. Yes, no, it's 2010. It is now 2011, so last year. Um, so looking at the clients with PTSD and BPD in Marsha's last um, CT, the 2006 study uh, with uh, DBT compared to treatment by experts, um, so in the DBT condition, those clients who had PTSD, which was half of them, um, we looked at two of the common things that we would say needed to be under control from the PTSD treatment side of the world, that they wouldn't take clients who were engaging in these behaviors. So imminent risk of suicide um, or recent uh, self-injury or suicidal behavior. So uh, this we looked at to see, okay, how are our clients doing during DBT in terms of getting those behaviors under control so that they might seem to be um, appropriate candidates for a PTSD treatment based on that definition. So um, as you see over time, going through one year of treatment, by the end, more than two-thirds had those behaviors under control during that final four-month period, meaning there was no self-injury, no suicide attempts, no indication they were at imminent risk of suicide um, in the last four months of treatment. So it seems like they're actually getting um, quite well controlled on the whole during treatment. So we made it a little harder. Um, so we added in, not only did they have to not have any suicide attempts or self-injury or be at imminent risk of suicide, but also they had to be below a cutoff for severe dissociation and they had to be um, 
not have uh, substance dependence disorder. These two being things that are currently in the prolonged exposure therapy manual as possible reasons to exclude somebody from the treatment. So not across the board does everybody get excluded, but you would want to consider on a case-by-case basis whether you think this person might not be appropriate because their dissociation is so severe or their substance dependence is so severe. So we added those in, and we so have these two plus those two, and you can see as we go up, we end up with half of the PTSD clients um, having uh, gotten rid of all those behaviors by the end of treatment. Um, so it seems like, at least for some of the clients with PTSD, the majority actually, uh, in one year of DBT, are able to get these behaviors under control enough that we might think that they would be a reasonable candidate for exposure therapy for PTSD. So if these aren't the reasons that their PTSD is not getting targeted, what do you think it is? Of course, you have the hands out, so you can see. Fear. This is what I think part of it is. Um, is, is as Martin talked about, there's a lot of concern about safety um, in this population and whether uh, exposure therapy for PTSD or any PTSD treatment might uh, increase risk or suicidality um, or exacerbate other problems in this population. And I think um, there's a lot of sort of concerns that might be the case uh, that have kept people from wanting to go forward with trying this out. So um, there's more to the story than that, which I will get to in a minute. But on on the topic of sort of safety concerns um, and fear, so is is it safe to treat PTSD in this client population? Uh, is the question. So PTSD treatment guidelines clearly say no. Um, They say if if any, so this is sort of, again, expert treatment guidelines um, from the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. It says if significant suicidality is present, it must be addressed before any other treatment is initiated. In the DBT manual, it says beware, essentially. It doesn't say no, but it says proceed with caution, more or less. Um, So I believe that the resulting havoc in the patient's life and the suicide risk are such that the treatment of post-traumatic stress has to be very carefully timed. So it's a totally reasonable thing to say, and I think that um, that sort of sense that we all just need to be very cautious about what we're doing here has has made it so a lot of people are just not sure that they want to even attempt it. Um, So there's that. I can just tell you, as a person trying to get a grant funded, saying that I was going to try to do this, um, that a lot of these concerns came up in the grant review process as well. And you can see that there was just sort of conflicted opinions on the review committee, with some of them, they were apparently having disagreements with each other (laughs) as they talked about it, but some of them saying very specifically that they thought this was going to make patients worse, um, and some of them on the other side arguing that they didn't think it was going to make patients worse. Um, Happily, the not making them more side one out, and they funded me, apparently. <laughs> so my response back to them was, you know, there's no data. We don't actually know um, to suggest that BPD clients are likely to get worse. Um, we have some data that um, suggests that they're not likely to. Um, and this is an empirical question that needs to be answered. So this is what I have set out to do. So what are the other reasons why PTSD hasn't been targeted um, routinely in DBT? Um, Besides the fact that it's an anxiety-provoking undertaking for clinicians as well as for uh, clients sometimes, waiting times, um, the DBT manual also doesn't, at this point, include any specific information about exactly when to do it. So it talks about it in terms of the stages of treatment, for example, but without any really specific criteria about exactly when one would start uh, PTSD-focused treatment. Um, Secondly to that, um, there's also not a specific protocol for how exactly to treat PTSD when you do get to the point where a client is ready for it. Um, You know, so the question here is, do you just bring in a PTSD treatment that already exists, like prolonged exposure therapy, um, and just follow it by the book, or do you actually need to make modifications um, for the specific client population? So I think another thing that has gotten in the way of people taking this on during DBT um, at times is just sort of not being sure exactly when or exactly how to do it. So um, I'm just going to give you sort of the overview of what the treatment is looking like that we're developing. So uh, 
the, everybody is getting standard DBT, um, which in our research settings has been for one year. Uh, at some point, so the, and when they first come in, they are all people who are recently suicidal and self-injuring and typically ongoing um, at the beginning of treatment. So the, the beginning of the treatment phase is really focused on getting behavioral control um, and acquiring skills necessary to do that. At some point, this is an arbitrary placement on the year, at whatever point they become ready, which I'll talk to you more about, we add in um, this DBT PTSD protocol. Um, and it's during that portion of the treatment where they really are engaged in the emotional processing of the traumatic event, or events, always events, actually. <laughs> Um, and then, assuming that they finish that before, in our setting, their year of treatment is up, then the remaining uh, part of the year is essentially whatever other goals they have um, in their lives at that point, ideally figuring out how to have a life without PTSD in it, uh, as Martin talked about. And, and a lot of times this has really seemed to focus for people on how to um, build new relationships, uh, change some of their existing relationships so that they are... Uh, more effective, where they are saying no to people when they want to say no and things like that. So just to make the point that this, this sort of general conceptualization maps on to um, the stages of trauma recovery that are sort of uh, originally from Judith Herman, sort of more the psychodynamic model of how uh, people recover from trauma, where this idea that there's an initial stage of establishing safety and stability, a second stage where they're doing what they call remembrance and mourning, and a third stage of reconnection with the world. Okay, so the reason you will soon discover there are no data slides in your handouts <laughs> uh, is because the results are quite uh, preliminary and not yet published. Um, so I just wanted to make that point very clearly that the data I'm showing uh, are subject to change and uh, I feel reasonably confident at this point that what I'm showing you isn't likely to change much, but just to say it hasn't yet been published. So what is um, the open trial that we're doing or have done? Um, the specific aims, what we were trying to do is to finalize this um, PTSD protocol uh, for DBT <laughs> using a sort of small sample doing pre-post design um, specifically, what we were interested in is figuring out this, the feasibility of this treatment, um, how safe it is, how acceptable it is to clients, and to take in all that information as we are developing the treatment and revising it. Um, and then one of the big questions we knew we were going to have to contend with um, from the get-go was how to figure out whether we thought clients were ready to begin this PTSD protocol part of the treatment. So just so you know, the, this open trial, the treatment's done, um, and the final follow-up assessments will be done in the next two weeks. Um, so I hope to have a publication ready to get out soon. Um, but we did a year of treatment, and we did assessments when they first came in. We did it halfway through at the mid-treatment mark, six months. Uh, Post-treatment is 12 months, and then we're doing one follow-up assessment three months later, which is what's not totally complete. So um, the recruitment criteria, so inclusion, we are at this point focusing on women, ages 18 to 60, they all meet criteria for BPD, they all meet criteria for PTSD, um, not specific to any trauma type, so we're taking PTSD related to whatever types of trauma they've experienced. Um, and then this open trial, we started with this requirement of having at least one high-risk behavior on the scene. So within the past three months, a suicide attempt or serious non-suicidal self-injury, um, or they met this definition of being at imminent risk of suicide, which um, included things like a plan to kill themselves, intent to kill themselves within the next four weeks, um, and a high degree of suicidal ideation along with that. Um, or they were above a cutoff for severe dissociation. Um, I'll show, tell you more about the sample in a minute, but I'll just suffice it to say at this point, all of the clients that we accepted came in under these two criteria. So it was um, everybody was either recently suicidal or self-injuring or at imminent risk of killing themselves. Uh, the exclusion criteria that we used are uh, bipolar or psychotic disorders were excluded. 
This is sort of the way that um, DBT research has been done in our clinic, simply because of the focus on replacing pills with skills, where we are ideally trying to get people to taper off of meds um, and really trying to you know, set up the research so we're evaluating more of a behavioral intervention than a medical intervention, and obviously that is not uh, a reasonable thing to do for bipolar and psychotic folks, which is why uh, they have been excluded. Um, also mental retardation and if they were mandated to treatment uh, because we wanted them to be free to drop out. So quick look at the sample. Um, so we ended up taking 13 clients in. So like I said, all of them, uh, 12 of them had recent uh, self-injury or suicide attempts and the one who didn't was this person who was at imminent risk of suicide who we really thought uh, was likely to kill herself in the next week when we took her in. Um, and Within that, what was interesting was that uh, about two-thirds of the sample met criteria for severe dissociation or above this cutoff where they likely had a dissociative disorder. So basically, if you recruit for people who are suicidal and self-injuring and have a BPD along with it, as Martin was saying, you're going to get a lot of folks who struggle a lot with dissociation. Um, so defining their index traumas. So uh, again, this is by the client's report, whatever trauma is most distressing to them. Um, so the majority, it's childhood sexual abuse, um, and then you can sort of see the range. But I should make the caveat that this was their index trauma, um, and this is sort of from a field of many, many, many traumas. So in this population, um, the average n t number of different types of trauma they'd experienced was 14 types of trauma. Uh, in their lifetime. And within a type, say childhood sexual abuse, you know, the average number of actual events is going to be how, you know, if it was going on for 12 years, who knows how many events. But so that is recurrent trauma, but the different types, there was 14 on average types. The age of onset of trauma, the earliest trauma was age five uh, in the sample, the average. So a highly traumatized group. In terms of comorbidity, um, an average of four, axis one, two, axis two. So we've got people here meeting criteria for six diagnoses on average, um, and low functioning scores as you would expect. Okay, so developing this DBT PTSD protocol, talking a little bit about the structure of the treatment. Um, as we have standard DBT for one year, like I said, not modified in any way from the manual. So everybody got individual therapy for at least an hour a week, DBT group skills training for two and a half hours a week, telephone coaching as needed between sessions, and the therapists all sat on a consultation team for an hour a week. Um, and the, the PTSD protocol part of it is a modified slightly version of prolonged exposure therapy for PTSD. It was administered um, concurrently with DBT, so whenever they were getting that part of the treatment, they were still getting all of standard DBT at the same time. Um, and it's always being administered by their individual DBT therapist is doing both. Um, I'll say more about this, but on average so far, um, it has taken 13 sessions to do the um, PTSD protocol part of the treatment. So um, I wasn't gonna go into a ton of detail, <laughs> about exactly what we modified. I'll tell you some about it, but let me just tell you my general approach has been to take prolonged exposure therapy by the book, try to implement it by the book, and to only make modifications when that wasn't working. <laughs> um, so sort of uh, trying to minimize the modifications and stay as close to their mod model as we could but changing really when we thought it was really critical given our client population and the different kind of clients that we had. So a little bit of DBT magic built into it. So specifically the areas of modification, um, at the high level some of the things we've been changing about PE. Um, as Martin said, there's no protocols within PE or any other PTSD treatment that I know of specifically to address um, issues of suicidality or self-harm if they were to occur. Um, I think simply because they exclude all those people from the treatment, so they haven't had to deal with that very often. So a lot of the modifications I've made are about figuring out ways to make sure we're constantly assessing people's suicide and self-harm urges and behaviors um, and strategies for managing those if they're increasing or if a behavior actually 
occurs in the middle of the PTSD treatment, what we would do about it. Um, we've also, specific to our population, uh, discovered that they are different in some ways, for sure, from the way the PE manual was written, um, which was primarily, it was originally designed for women who had experienced a rape um, as an adult. So it was designed for, for people with you know, one trauma most of the time. So in our population, as I've said, our clients have scads of trauma. Um, and so we've had to make adjustments to the manual to address the fact that they have multiple, multiple traumas and to figure out procedures for exactly how we would choose which trauma to start with and how many traumas to target during the treatment, knowing that there was rarely, if ever, going to be a case where there was just one. Um, and in that, just to make the point, this isn't something um, I had walked into this thinking I was going to be doing, but uh, it's what the clients have needed and asked for. But So we have clients who have lifetimes of trauma, and trauma by the definition of the DSM-4 means that it was an event that um, they experienced physical injury, threat to their personal integrity, threat to their life, or somebody around them that they observed had one of those things happen. So for sure this covers things like rape and sexual abuse and physical attacks and car accidents and all that kind of stuff where there's a threat to your bodily integrity or harm or injury. But our clients reported to us, um, which was slightly disheartening as a mother, I have to tell you, um, <laughs> It's a hard thing, um, which is that they, so they would have all this trauma, and then they would say, and the thing that upsets me the most is that my mother didn't love me, or my mother was mean to me, or my mother sort of would go into rages unpredictably without violence. None of those things from a DSM perspective would count as trauma. Verbal abuse, emotional neglect, all of those kinds of events don't officially qualify people for a PTSD diagnosis, but as Martin showed, the data are incredibly prevalent in our population, um, and often the most distressing things that they say currently haunt them. So we figured we had to have a way to address those kinds of traumas, because they're clearly traumatic to our clients, whether or not they're officially recognized as trauma by the American Psychiatric Association. So, um, so we've built in strategies for addressing these types of what we say non-criterion A traumas, criterion A being the criterion in the PTSD diagnosis that specifies it has to have uh, physical injury and all those kinds of things. Um, and essentially we treat them the same way we treat the other traumas, um, doing exposure to these kinds of events in the very same way. Um, in our population, we have a lot more of what the PE manual calls over-engagement showing up. So over-engagement means that during the exposure, they become so emotionally overwhelmed that they are just not able to learn new information. Martin had some very nice data showing that they're, in fact, not able to learn new information, for example, when they're dissociated. So dissociation being the most common type of over-engagement that we're dealing with in our population and having to design some very specific strategies for clients who end up dissociated in the middle of exposure. Martin and I have collaborated a lot on this, so we're doing similar types of things, but ice packs and balance boards and sour candies and whatever sort of intense physical sensations you can get on the scene during exposure to keep them present in the room. Um, and we're doing it only, though, for the clients who actually show evidence of this over-engagement or dissociation, so it's not across the board always there. Um, another problem in this population is that they have a ton of shame. So whereas PTSD treatments are uh, essentially created to deal with the problem of fear, PTSD being an anxiety disorder, so the focus of treatment is on anxiety or fear, in our population just as common or perhaps even more intense in many clients is the emotion of shame in relation to their traumas. And so we have uh, built in specific ways to address unjustified shame by including that in their exposure tasks that they're doing in the in vivo hierarchy, very similar to Shireen Rizvi's approach for using opposite action for shame, or essentially building an opposite action for shame into the exposure tasks that they're doing. Okay, so the big question, when to start um, during the course of standard DBT? So we are saying that they are not eligible to begin the, the PTSD protocol part of the treatment until they are no longer at imminent risk of suicide. Uh, 
we played with lots of different time frames and ways of thinking about this, and we've landed at the moment on requiring them to be totally abstinent from all forms of non-suicidal self-injury or suicidal behavior for at least two months. This is all forms. So this is even very low risk self-injury, like hitting themselves in the leg or picking scabs um, for the point of injuring themselves. All sorts of behaviors. We have a zero tolerance policy, and I'll tell you why, in terms of when we start the PTSD part of the treatment. So two months of none of that. Um, we want to make sure that they haven't managed to get their two months of abstinence simply by avoiding everything in the world that wants, makes them want to self-injure or attempt suicide. So an example being if they um, typically only self-injure after they interact with their sister, um, if they've just avoided any contact with their sister for two months and that's how they've pulled it off, we'd be quite worried about that. Um, and we'd want to make sure that they could actually encounter whatever the typical cues are for them in the world uh, for self-injury and suicidal behavior and still not do the behavior. So we will, if we need to, set up specific tasks for them to demonstrate that they can do that. No serious therapy interfering behavior. So we're working our way down the DBT target hierarchy, right? So these are all in the life-threatening behavior category. Therapy interfering behavior in DBT, um, what I mean here is really serious. So we routinely start treatment with people who don't fill their diary cards out sometimes or miss sessions you know, at times or whatever version of therapy interfering behavior. They're hostile intermittently, that kind of stuff. Um, by serious, I mean essentially they're not engaged in treatment. They show up so infrequently um, or they never in their life are going to do homework um, or they come every time and just scream at you for the whole session. Um, this is the kind of therapy interfering behavior where we would say this is so serious that they're essentially not engaged in treatment. We just don't think there's a way we could make the PTSD treatment work with them as long as this is going on. Moving into quality of life, PTSD has to be the highest priority target for the client and the client has to want to treat it. Um, so when we move into the quality of life domain in DBT, this really becomes the client's goals. They get to choose what we're doing in treatment at that point. So um, this has to actually be something they want to do and it has to be their highest priority, um, which isn't always the case. Some clients don't want to deal with their PTSD because it's, too, it's so mild that they've got bigger problems or for whatever reason it's not important to them. Um, and then we've added in this having the ability and the willingness, which are two different things at times, um, to experience intense emotions without escaping. So prolonged exposure therapy requires sitting with very intense emotions um, as you're describing your traumatic experiences. So if you're not able to do that without dissociating, running out of the room, distracting yourself, thinking about your grocery list, or whatever it might be, um, it's less likely the treatment's going to work for you. So we want to have some pretty solid evidence that people are actually able to have an intense emotion and just sit with it and not do anything to change it, push it away, suppress it, all that kind of stuff, at least for a chunk of time that they can pull that off for, say, 30 minutes um, would be what we're looking for. Okay, so is the treatment acceptable to clients? This was the, the main concern we had, the main goal uh, in terms of the aims of this part of the research. So we asked people when they came in at intake, what kind of treatment would you like to get? Um, and we gave descriptions of DBT and a description of prolonged exposure therapy. And we asked them, would you want to get DBT only? Would you want to get PE only? Or would you want to combine treatment? 85% um, of them at intake are saying they actually prefer a combined DBT and PE treatment. Um, the ones who didn't want that wanted just DBT by itself. Nobody wanted just PE by itself. Um, so this was good news, walking in the door. I wasn't sure, honestly, whether people would say, no way, no how am I going near an exposure treatment for PTSD. Um, they actually really prefer it over other options in combination with DBT. Why do they want it? So here's some quotes from a couple of our clients. So, I haven't had a chance to tell my story and I'm derailed by it. I feel like a hamster running in circles because I haven't been able to talk about it. So this is a common experience for our clients who, as Martin said, have chronic PTSD, have often been in the mental health system for 20, 30 years, and have never been able to have their PTSD addressed. Um, so they sort of feel like they're coming in, they're coming in, they're not able to, to talk about it. 
Another person said, the unconscious reminders of PTSD is what slips me back into BPD episodes where I will spiral down for months at a time after I've been making progress. So they have some quite compelling reasons why they would prefer to get a combined DBT and PTSD treatment. So that was good news. Um, then in terms of their expectancies, how effective do they think it's going to be for them? Um, if you look at baseline when they're coming in compared to right after their first therapy session, they first met their therapist, talked a little bit about what's to come, and at the mid-treatment mark, um, expectancies are, are very high, so a seven-point scale, they're above a six at all time points. So not only do they prefer the treatment, but they strongly believe that it's actually going to help them. Also very good news. So this is at the end of treatment. So the people who um, completed the treatment, what were their satisfaction ratings at the end? Also, uh, this is a one to four scale, just looking at the overall um, satisfaction with treatment and the overall quality of the treatment, for example, also very high. So in terms of just looking at acceptability in this population, they want it, they think it's gonna help them, and they're very satisfied with it once they get it. So another concern um, with doing this kind of treatment in this population is that it was going to cause them to run screaming from your office and never come back, um, that we were going to have higher dropout rates from treatment than we would have if we weren't asking them uh, to do this exposure-based PTSD treatment. So just looking at the results we're getting, this is this study, that my study, we had a 23% dropout rate. Um, compared to Marsha's last study and standard DBT as a whole, it was 25%. And if you only look at the clients with PTSD, it was 23%. So we were getting identical dropout rates. No evidence that adding in a PTSD treatment is making people leave the treatment. So how many of them are actually getting the treatment, all, the, all components of it that it could be available to them? So in the sample, intent to treat sample, there were 13. Three of them over here never started the PTSD protocol part of the treatment, which is totally optional if they want to do it or not. So three of them never started it, but those three are the three that dropped out. Um, so they're the ones that they all dropped out before it would have been a reasonable thing to do at any rate. Um, so of the 10 people who completed the year of treatment, all of them at least started the PTSD protocol part of the treatment. Seven of them completed it, three did not complete it. Uh, the three who didn't complete it did either um, two or three sessions of it and then didn't continue further. So um, when did we start it with the people who started it? On average, it was after 18 weeks of DBT, so between four and five months of uh, D DBT focusing entirely on getting behaviors under control. Um, did we start, which was a lot quicker than I would have predicted walking into this. And on average, like I said, we've done, it's taken 13 sessions to do uh, with a range of six up to 19 being the um, high end of the scale of how many sessions it has taken us. I should say that um, PE by the book um, goes for either 10 or 12 sessions and they stop at that point no matter what. Um, and what we're using is we, we continue until the clients tell us they're satisfied. Um, and that they have gotten enough reduction or relief that they feel like they don't need to do more. So that's our criteria for when to stop, and it's taken about 13 sessions. So the big question, um, is the treatment safe? So we asked people before and after every single exposure task they did, so whether it's in session with us doing imaginal exposure or out of session, listening to their imaginal exposure tapes or doing in vivo exposure in the real world. Every single task, they fill out a form uh, to tell us what their urges to kill themselves and to self-harm were right before they did the exposure and right after they did the exposure, as well as in the middle of doing the exposure. Um, but this is the before and after. So rated immediately before and after, what you see is the vast majority of the time, there's no change whatsoever in urges to kill themselves or self-harm. Um, and that they are actually more likely to decrease, the urges are likely to decrease than they are to increase as an immediate result of doing exposure. And that's because people sometimes come in with all this anticipatory anxiety, they're really worried about how it's gonna go that day. Get, actually doing it and getting done can be a relief. Um, that urges come down a bit. So in terms of worry that we are um, causing people to have massive increases in urges regularly, that's not at all the case. Um, it's not 
common. In general, we haven't had increases um, in suicide attempts, self-injury, hospitalizations, or ER visits. There's no evidence that any of those things are increasing over the course of the treatment or as a result of the PTSD part of the treatment. Um, and in fact, they appear to be self-injuring less than in the last RCT um, that Marsha did of standard DBT. So um, Marsha's, the data from that study are the yellow columns and the, my current study are blue. So if you just look at those zero to four months of treatment, um, this is shocking. Uh, this is uh, in the last RCT, 73% of the clients in DBT engaged in non-suicidal self-injury in the first four months of treatment using very, very similar inclusion criteria, recruiting for people who were recently self-injuring. Um, and we had 9% uh, in the first four months of treatment who self-injured. And you can see that that trend holds. Um, we had one person who attempted suicide right here, but otherwise no suicide attempts during the treatment. Why in the world could that be true, given that we were all worried they were going to be doing those things more often? Um, here's what we're finding, and this is what I think is going on, is essentially if you have a person with PTSD who's had PTSD for 30 years and nobody's been willing to treat it, they haven't been able to get access to PTSD treatment, you bring them in and you say, look, I have an effective PTSD treatment for you, but I'm not doing it until you stop self-injuring and you stop trying to kill yourself. You set up a contingency in session one if treating PTSD is their goal. If it's not, then you wouldn't go here necessarily. But if they say they really want to treat their PTSD, then we make it very clear about what they'll need to do in order for us to do that. Um, and that's clear from the beginning. And we've had a lot of clients who come in and who stop self-injuring immediately, who never self-injure during the treatment. The majority of them in this study did that because they were so desperate to get their PTSD treated that they were willing to do whatever we said they had to do <laughs> in order to get that. All right, so does it show promise for treating PTSD? So here are the effect sizes um, from pre-treatment to mid-treatment to post-treatment. Um, the pre to post, we have uh, 1.9, and going back to that meta-analysis, Bradley, 2005, uh, looking at just generally exposure treatments for PTSD, the pre-post effect size has been 1.6, so we seem to be on the mark for what's found in PTSD treatment studies in general. Um, in terms of reliable change, so you know, a statistically reliable change in symptoms, um, you can see that the about uh, three quarters showed a reliable improvement in PTSD. We had a handful of clients who didn't change, primarily the ones who didn't complete the PTSD protocol part of the treatment. And we had nobody whatsoever who got worse in terms of their PTSD. So in terms of that fear of thinking people were actually going to get worse, um, that doesn't seem to be the case. In terms of actual remission rates of PTSD from mid-treatment, uh, mid so I split this up into the people, the seven people who completed the full shebang, and they did all of the DBT and the PTSD protocol, the three people who just uh, did the DBT but didn't complete the PTSD part of it, and then the intent to treat sample, everybody all together, including the people who dropped out of treatment. So, um, so what we're seeing, just look at the post-treatment. So in the people who completed the PTSD part of the treatment, we had a 71% remission rate. Compared to this meta-analysis of treatment completers, it's 68%. They're quite comparable. In the intent to treat sample as a whole, we had 60. And in that meta-analysis, they had 53% remission. So um, we are getting very comparable results, favorable results, in terms of the PTSD treatment literature in general. Uh, in terms of other outcomes, just a sneak peek. Um, are we actually treating other things too, which you would, which go along with trauma? A lot of the things that Martin said are often there. So uh, pathological dissociation, um, you'll see this effect size is, you know, very small at mid-treatment, but by the time they get to the end, we have a very nice effect. Um, same with trauma-related guilt and shame, and then depression, we get a sooner effect that stays constant over the treatment. So it looks like we're having a good effect on sort of that broader range of trauma-related outcomes. So uh, I get the privilege of getting to do exit interviews with all the clients who come through. So this is what, just to give a little snapshot here of what one of the women 
said to me, um, I've been through counselor after counselor since I was 15, so I had no expectations. I was just looking for a way to cope, and I got that. I mean, I have the desire to live. Um, I think PE was the most effective for me in conjunction with DBT, but PE was what gave me the clarification, and that's where I was finally able to change certain things in my life. Always happy things to hear. <laughs> I love getting to meet with them at the end. Um, so very preliminary conclusions, knowing that this is still underway. This is a small sample and uncontrolled trial and lots of caveats. Um, but at the moment, it seems as if this, uh, this treatment is at least acceptable to and actually preferred by the majority of uh, clients in this population that we're trying to reach. It looks like it can be implemented for most of them within one year of uh, DBT treatment. Uh, it retains clients the same as standard DBT does, no evidence of higher attrition rates. Looks like it can be administered safely and it shows promise um, as an effective treatment for PTSD as well as that sort of conglomeration of other trauma-related outcomes. So next steps, uh, what we're currently doing and where we're headed. Um, I, there's a pilot randomized clinical trial that started six or seven months ago um, that's ongoing, and we uh, have our work cut out for this in this trial in terms of trying to see if we can replicate any of these findings um, because we've, uh, for whatever reason, seem to be recruiting a much more suicidal and high-risk sample than the first group of folks. Um, and then I'm also using a wider range of therapists with different uh, degrees of experience and training. Um, so I spend many a night thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, but it's going quite well on the whole, and um, there's always lots to learn. So we'll see if we end up uh, replicating the results, and we should know in a couple years. So, <laughs> um, All right. And lots of people to acknowledge, of course, Marsha, who this would not at all be possible without, um, and Edna Foa, who's uh, been a consultant on the project, and all my therapists. Uh, and wonderful people at the BRTC, but I really just want to say particularly how grateful I am to the clients. Um, we've been very open with them, uh, of course, that they are in a treatment development study, uh, which means that we are actively developing a treatment with them. Uh, it's something that hasn't necessarily been done before and that we're trying to learn from them, and they have a lot to teach us. Um, and they have been, uh, they have signed on to the mission with us in a way that I wouldn't have necessarily expected, but they, they fondly called themselves in skills group the 11 guinea pigs. <laughs> um, but they, they have been amazing, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad that we're able to help them, and they've helped us just as much. So thank you. So it looks like there's maybe five minutes before break. Question number one. <laughs> Do you think there was a possibility that clients reported they had enough treatment before they were actually ready to be done? Excellent question. This is, of course, the concern that avoidance is showing up on the scene and they're saying, okay, I'm done now, uh, when you're getting to the hard part. Um, we haven't, well, of course, our clients have wanted to avoid and escape at different times in different ways, but we haven't yet had the experience of feeling like people were just ending because they were avoiding. They're ending because their PTSD is in remission, um, or they're ending because they've gotten enough of a reduction in their symptoms that they feel like they can tolerate what they have. And sometimes they're ending because we've bumped up against the end of the treatment year, um, and there's not more time to do more. Um, but I can say that not a single person who has ended, uh, who's gone through to the end of the PTSD part of the treatment, do I believe at this point has ended because they were just trying to avoid it. The people who didn't complete it, those three people, that was a factor in why they, they chose not to complete it, was they just decided it, they, it wasn't for them and they weren't willing to do more. So, Any other questions? I'm using a different, so the question is, do I have CAPS scores to compare with Martin's data? And of course I was thinking the same thing as you were going through your thing, and I'm not using the CAPS, I'm using a different instrument, but we surely need to find a way to compare severity in our two samples. So, 
So the question is, did I consider using cognitive processing therapy instead of PE? Um, I considered it, <laughs> um, but the reason that I um, chose PE was because it's more consistent, uh, for one thing, with DBT, which is primarily a behavioral treatment, over a cognitive treatment, and where the manual already very clearly recommends the use of exposure to treat PTSD, so it's in line with the DBT manual already, for sure. Um, and PE just has more empirical support behind it, just more research has been done on it than CPT, but CPT is also an evidence-based treatment, for sure, for PTSD. <laughs> Right. So the question is, so for people who wouldn't officially meet the criteria for PTSD because of this Criterion A issue where they've experienced trauma but not the kind of trauma that qualifies for a PTSD diagnosis, and what would you do with those folks? I don't have any data that I can sort of lay this behind, so this is purely clinical. Um, because all of our folks do meet criteria for PTSD, but we have um, targeted their non-criterion A traumas in exactly the same way we would target a criterion A trauma, doing imaginal exposure, telling the story of exactly what the event was, you know, over and over till it's no longer as distressing to them. So from a clinical perspective, I see no reason not to try that if they have an event that they've experienced as traumatic in that way. Um, this seems like a reasonable thing to try without data to tell you for sure. All right. One more? Is that what you want? Okay. Um, so the question, you set the criteria for when to start PTSD treatment. What do you think would happen if therapy to treat PTSD was started earlier than your criteria? It's an excellent question. Um, and I have no idea <laughs> because I haven't tried to do it. Um, it's entirely possible that you could start earlier and get the same results. It's also entirely possible that you could start earlier and have more trouble with self-harm and suicidal behavior showing up during the treatment. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a clinical judgment that we've had to try to set some specific rules for, simply for mostly the sake of dissemin dissemination. Um, so I, I don't have a clear answer about what would happen, because this is sort of where we're going right now, is requiring that two-month window. Um, you know, an option is if you, you have somebody who's still self-injuring or it's more recent than that. That's why Martin's uh, research done in a residential setting allows people to still be actively self-injuring when they start because they're in a residential setting where they can manage those safety issues more readily because they're there with them all day. So it might be something to, to you know, obviously go for if you have a residential setting um, or an inpatient unit to do it on. All right, we're done.